In this video lecture, we're going to look at cardiac muscle physiology. If you don't remember the skeletal muscle contractions and action potentials associated with skeletal muscle, please review that video on skeletal muscle contraction and, and action potentials before you start this. Otherwise, this video is going to be really confusing. So we're going to first look at cardiac muscle cell structure, and then we'll look at cardiac muscle cells contraction or the excitation contraction coupling. Then we'll look at the action potentials associated with the heart. There are actually two types of action potentials, one associated with the cardiac muscle cell itself, and then another type of action potential that's associated with what are called autorhythmic cells. Think about that word autorhythmic, self-rhythm. So these are cells that generate an action potential on their own, and they're going to control the contractions or when those um, cardiac muscle cells contract. So we can have actually the heart beating without any central nervous system input. And what we'll end with last is then the how the central nervous system affects the heart, and that's the CAC and the CIC. So let's first look at the structure. Here's a cardiac muscle cell here in the center. Compared to skeletal muscle, it has the same striations patterns that we see. But remember, skeletal muscle is voluntary. Cardiac muscle is involuntary, and that's really the only thing they have in common are those striations. Otherwise, a lot of differences between them. The big difference we see with cardiac muscle is first it's branch, as you can see here, and second, it has what are called intercalated discs. These are this folding cell membranes where two cells come adjacent to each other. So in this picture, we've got one cardiac cell here We've got a piece of a cardiac cell here, and so here's the desmos, or the intercalated disc that connects the two. Here's an intercalated disc that connects these two. And then here's an intercalated disc that connects this cell with this cell, although they've just separated them out, so you can kind of see inside. If we look at this intercalated disc and see what it's composed of, a couple structures that are important is one are these um, desmosomes. The desmosomes are like rivets. They basically hold the two cells together. And I need this because when a muscle contracts, I don't want the muscle cells to separate from each other. I need them to all contract and stay together so the heart can function as a good pump. If they separated, that wouldn't be a very good pump. There's no force behind that. So that's the desmosomes do. They hold those cells together. The other structure are the gap junctions. These are basically pores or holes between two adjacent cells, and that allows the cytoplasm to move between one cell and the next cell. And we're going to need that because we want the action potentials to travel from one cell to the next. We don't want to have synapses like you see with neurons because that means you got to release the neurotransmitter, and then it has to diffuse across, and then it has to bind a receptor and cause and a uh, graded potential. That just takes too long. We don't have that kind of time in a heart muscle. So we need to get the action potentials from one cell to the next very quickly and that's what those gap junctions allow us to do. Now another difference we see with cardiac muscle cells is the number of mitochondria. 25 to 30 percent of the cytoplasm of a cardiac muscle cell is made up of mitochondria. In skeletal muscle, it's only about 2% that's mitochondria. That's a big difference. Now, at first, I thought that was a little strange. You would think muscle, skeletal muscle cells would need lots of mitochondria since we're you know, lifting big weights and moving around all the time. But if you think about it, cardiac muscle cells are contracting all the time. And so we need lots of mitochondria to provide all the ATPs we, needed, we need in order for a muscle to contract. We also want to make sure it's all aerobic respiration in here. That is using oxygen to make lots of ATPs. We don't want anaerobic respiration because that means we build up lactic acid and would cause the muscle to fatigue. That would be bad. Not, we don't want a cardiac muscle fatigue. So we have lots of mitochondria making lots of ATPs, but that means we got to have lots of oxygen available to those cardiac muscle cells as well. Now let's look at cardiac excitation contraction coupling. Basically, how does a cardiac muscle contract? This is going to be very similar to skeletal muscle. The difference starts out, though, is how we get it going. 
and that's basically through those gap junctions. So let's assume there's already an action potential in this cell, and that action potential then can travel right through that gap junction to get this cell to have an action potential. Okay, so the current, the depolarizing current or the action potential is going to pass right through the gap junction. And then it's going to travel along the cell membrane and down the T-tubules. As it passes through the cell membrane, it's going to open up calcium channels that are in the cell membrane. So here we've got lots of calcium concentrated outside the cell, very little inside the cell, so the calcium now can diffuse in. That's going to trigger release of calcium from the sarcoplasmic reticulum. So these channels open up too, releasing calcium. So you can see already we have a difference, another difference I really, between skeletal muscle and cardiac muscle is that we have two sources of calcium. One, an extracellular fluid calcium, and the other, the sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium. Both of them open up in response to the action potentials, so we get a huge amount of calcium dumped into the cytoplasm. That calcium is going to bind to troponin. The troponin then causes tropomyosin to move out of the way of the binding sites on the actin. Now myosin can grab a hold of the actin binding sites, forming cross bridges. The heads swing, you get a muscle contraction. As long as there's calcium present, those myosin heads can keep grabbing the actin, swinging, causing muscle contraction. Once I remove the calcium, which is described how that happens over here, a muscle will relax because without actin, or excuse me, without calcium bound to the um, troponin, the tropomyosin covers up the binding sites. Myosin can't grab a hold of it, so now we have relaxation. So how do we remove the calcium? Well, just like we did in skeletal muscle, we're going to pump it back into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And since we have an extracellular source of calcium, let's just pump it back in, outside of the cell. Then we have this other structure here called the sodium calcium exchanger that can also remove calcium. Now this exchanger is going to be important when it comes to some um, drug, how a drug works. So we want to spend a little time here. This is a co-transport system or an antiport in the sense that we're going to use sodium as the driving force to pump calcium. So how this works is that sodium is concentrated outside the cell, just like any cell. Remember, we have that sodium potassium pump pumping sodium out. So we have lots of sodium outside, very little sodium in. So sodium wants to diffuse from a high concentration to a low concentration and move into the cell. So the protein allows it to diffuse through. Now, as it's diffusing through, though, it causes the protein to change its shape so that protein can now pump calcium out. So think of this as kind of an energy source, this sodium gradient, high to low concentration movement of sodium, is the driving force of the energy for calcium to be pumped out. I like to think of this as kind of a grist mill. If you've ever seen a grist mill, those are those old mills that had a big wheel outside of it that had water flowing over the, the wheel, and then that turned the wheel, and then the gears inside the mill ground the flour. Well, this is kind of our own little grist mill here, in the sense, instead of water flowing over the wheel, we have sodium, and instead of a wheel, we have a protein. So if we think of the sodium gradient, that sodium diffusing from high concentration to low concentration, flowing over our wheel or protein, that gets that protein to turn, change its shape, and pump instead of, instead of grinding flour, we're going to pump calcium out. Okay? Now let's look at cardiac muscle action potential. That is the action potential inside or, or along the cell membrane of a cardiac muscle cell itself. Now the action potential is going to be a little different than what we've seen with um, neurons or skeletal muscle. At first it starts out just the same. We have some kind of stimulus opens up voltage-gated channels of sodium. That sodium rushes into the cell, adding posit positives to the inside, meaning that the membrane potential becomes less negative or more positive, and you get depolarization. Now, once you have depolarization, remember calcium starts moving in. We can see that on that previous slide. 
Remember, depolarizing current causes calcium to rush in. So if I've got calcium rushing in now, I'm adding positive to the inside, and that keeps this membrane potential high or forms this plateau. As long as we got calcium moving in, I maintain that plateau. But eventually I get a lot of, of potassium channels opening up. Potassium is concentrated inside, so the potassium moves out, and then we get repolarization here. So here's our repolarization. So the difference in this action potential then is we've got depolarization is due to sodium influx. That's the same. But we have a plateau caused by calcium influx and then repolarization by potassium efflux. What that does then is extends kind of the length of this absolute refractory period. Now, if you remember, the absolute refractory period is the time where you cannot hit that muscle cell with another stimulus to cause another action potential. It's during that absolute refractory period, there's absolutely no way you can get that cell to have another action potential. Now, why that is important is related to the muscle contraction. Here's the red is the muscle contracting. So here's it contracts and then it relaxes. Now, what I want to make sure I have is the muscle contracts so I can pump the blood and then relax, fill with blood, and then it's, the heart will fill with blood, and then the muscle contracts to pump it back out again. So I need to avoid tetanus. Remember, tetanus is when the muscle contracts and stays contracted. And it stays contracted because I get lots of action potentials in sequence very close together, keeping this muscle contracted all the way along here. I don't want that in cardiac muscle. If I have a cardiac muscle cell in tetanus, it can't pump blood. It needs to contract, push the blood out, relax so the heart can fill again, contract, push the blood out, relax, have the heart fill again. So I need to avoid tetanus. And this action potential allows that cardiac muscle cell to relax before it can possibly hit with another action potential to cause another um, muscle contraction. So having this very long absolute refractory period, by the time I can hit it with another stimulus to cause another muscle contraction, the muscle's practically relaxed. So again, I'm avoiding tetanus by having this plateau in our um, action potential. Now there are also autorhythmic cells. These are the pacemakers of the cell and they include all these structures I've listed over here and we'll see more about these in the next video lecture. But these again are basically self rhythmic cells or they produce their own active potential. So I literally could pull these cells out of the heart, put them in a dish, a petri dish with some fluids and watch that active potential keep being generated and generated. Okay? In theory, let's say we can do that. And how this works is because their action potential is a bit different from the other action potentials, either from skeletal muscle or the cardiac muscle cells. Basically, it starts out, we have what are called leaky sodium channels. That is, these sodium channels are somewhat open. Some of them are open. And since they're open, sodium starts to leak into the autorhythmic cell. As that sodium is leaking in, I'm adding positives to the inside, so notice that the membrane potential starts to move up or become less negative. I'm adding positives to the inside of the cell. So I slowly get leaking, leaky, leaky, leaky sodium, driving that membrane potential up until finally you hit a threshold. At that threshold, we are going to get depolarization. But here the depolarization is different. Now depolarization is due to calcium. Calcium flows into the cell. Calcium being positively charged means I add positives to the inside, making the inside less negative, and notice I get up to a peak here for my depolarization. And then the repolarization is the same as we've always seen, and that's potassium channels opening, potassium rushing out, removing positives from the inside, and that makes the membrane potential go down. So again, it, the difference is we've got leaky sodium slowly leaking in, raising the membrane potential, 
Depolarization is now caused by calcium channels opening up, calcium moving in, and then repolarization is still potassium moving out. And then once that we've established our regular membrane potential, then more sodium just leaks and leaks and leaks until you get another act, um, threshold. Now we've got calcium depolarization, potassium repolarization, and then it starts leaking all over again. So that leakiness of the sodium kind of drives these autorhythmic cells to have one action potential after another. And that's referred to as a pacemaker potential. Okay, this idea that we're constantly having our spontaneous change in membrane potential because of these leaky sodiums. Now the cardiac conduction system then is basically seen here, and again, we'll do more on this in the next video lecture, but basically think of this way, these autorhythmic cells that are in yellow drive the whole system. So here, the SA node, to the, what are, what's called the AV node, and then down the middle, those have that autorhythmic membrane potential. So you can see, for example, here's the SA node here. It's leaky, leaky, leaky sodium, calcium depolarization, and then um, potassium repolarization. Notice that this SA node then, that autorhythmic action potential, or that pacemaker potential, then causes the skeletal, or excuse me, the cardiac muscle of the atrium to contract. And so there's its action potential. So in response to the action potential, generated by the SA node, I'm going to get the atriums now to have an action potential so they contract. And then the AV node also has is a pacemaker potential, so here's its pacemaker potential, and here's the ventricles that are going to contract. But they still have the depolarization, plateau, repolarization kind of thing going on. So again, these ventricle muscles and the atrial muscles have that plateau to prevent tetanus. The SA node, the AV node, and the other structures listed here are the ones that have the pacemaker potential that then will trigger the action potentials for the muscle cells. Last thing then is to look at is going to be the input of the central nervous system in controlling heart rate. This is, remember again, I want you to think that the heart can beat on its own. I can do my Indiana Jones trick that I've mentioned in class before. I literally pull the heart out of the chest and I'm holding it in my hand. That heart could beat on its own because of those autorhythmic cells. I don't need input from the central nervous system for the heart to beat on its own because it has that autorhythmic action potentials involved. But I also, of course, want to be able to change the heart rate and so I use the central nervous system to do that. I have two structures in the medulla that are in charge of either increasing or decreasing heart rate. So you can see those here. There's what's called the cardioacceleratory center. This is a sympathetic division of the autonomic nervous system from the medulla. It senses a need, and we'll get into all that later, but let's say we need to raise our heart rate, so it's going to send impulses through the sympathetic nervous system, and that goes to the heart and causes the heart rate to go up. If I need to lower my heart rate for some reason, I have the cardioinhibitory center. You can see that also. It's up in the medulla as well. That sends impulses through the vagus nerve, which is parasympathetic, and it goes and innervates with the SA and AV node and causes the heart rate to decrease. So I can increase the heart rate with more impulses from the central nervous system's sympathetic nervous system, decrease heart rate through the vagus nerve or the parasympathetic nervous system. Okay, And look at the, also take a note on the heart itself where the innervation is. Notice parasympathetic only innervates the SA node and the AV node. The sympathetic innervates both of the SA node and the AV node, but it also innervates a lot of the cardiac muscle cells. So we'll see that's going to become important when we talk about how these two centers also affect the strength of contraction. But we'll get that in the next video lecture or down a couple video lectures.